Today we're going to discuss one of the most fundamental astronomical phenomena out there, accretion disks. Disks that we normally associate with black holes, usually supermassive kind, but disks that actually exist in a lot of different types of environments, resulting in the formation of a lot of different astronomical objects, anything from as small as a planet with its moons to as big as entire galaxies. But because it's such a ubiquitous phenomenon, what's really intriguing is that similar mathematics and similar types of effects tend to explain various observations and various types of formations in a lot of different types of environments. And there's really technically one main difference about accretion disks, the types of emissions they produce, which seems to be directly correlated with the mass of the central object. The more mass of the object, the more likely it's going to be producing very high frequencies or extremely high energy radiation visible in X-rays or sometimes even gamma rays spectra. And much smaller disks, the ones around smaller stars or around planets, will normally only be able to produce infrared emissions, but generally because of very similar effects. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss what scientists have recently discovered about accretion disks, discuss the phenomenon in a nutshell, and talk about the recent discoveries from the iconic galaxy you see right here, where scientists have just identified something nobody has ever seen before, helping us understand these disks just a little bit better. But first, I guess let's start with a few basics. So normally, all of these disks will produce a relatively similar spiral-like shape, with all of the matter around the object slowly falling into the center. And this particular effect seems to be quite ubiquitous as well. Generally, as any kind of a orbital disk forms around any kind of an object, all of these particles orbiting around the object are going to slowly interact with one another. In the process, this interaction does two things. First, they occasionally bump into one another, in essence converting some of their kinetic energy into something a little bit more visual, releasing some kind of a photon in the process. If this happens on the outskirts of the disk, normally the energies are relatively low, so we only get some of the lower frequencies, such as for example infrared light. Or actually for a lot of protoplanetary disks, it's an even lower frequency, such as for example microwave light. This is from the iconic ALMA telescope. And so this is only visible because of those interactions from tiny particles. But all of this energy released as light is basically a conversion of kinetic energy. And so since these particles now lost some of their kinetic energy, they're not going to approach the star just a little bit closer. But the closer you get to the central object, the higher your orbital velocity, which basically means that now collisions experience even more energy loss, which means that there is now even more kinetic energy involved. And so even though on the outskirts we'll be seeing a lot of lower frequencies, the closer to the star you get, the more energetic emissions tend to become. But for protoplanetary disks, the velocity change is still not really that dramatic, so the actual energy change here is kind of minuscule. But for things like black holes and neutron stars, things get a little bit more extreme. Here, the closer you get, the closer to the speed of light the velocity tends to get as well. And so right at the edge of the black hole's event horizon, some particles can reach ridiculously high speeds, and collisions here will produce extremely high energy, and thus produce illumination in frequencies that are ridiculously powerful, very often X-rays, sometimes gamma rays, and generally a lot and a lot of luminosity. So much energy that they produce the brightest objects of them all, quasars and blazers. Accretion disks so bright we can literally see them from the edge of the universe. We've recently discussed one of these objects known as UHZ-1, detected recently by the James Webb. That one was located approximately 28 billion light years away from us, and it essentially represents a new type of an object, overmassive central black hole. A black hole so massive and so powerful that the accretion disk around it is just super bright. There's just no other word to describe it. So definitely super fascinating objects. And by itself, they actually have their own type of science. It's known as disco seismology. It's actually related to the study of oscillations inside accretion disks in order to learn what's happening around them. But there is a small caveat when it comes to these disks. Many of them, like the ones around stars, we can definitely physically see. These are all taken by a telescope. But the ones around black holes or neutron stars, and especially the ones around supermassive black holes, are actually not visible to us, or at least technically. I mean, this was supposed to be the first image of such object, 
but this is more of a reconstruction, not an exact picture. And so the majority of accretion disks out there are impossible for us to image. They're extremely small in size, they're also usually really far away from us, and it's only possible to study them using different types of spectra and using very specific emissions that scientists now kind of understand pretty well. And so today we're going to be discussing one of these studies from one of the recent papers. But I guess one important question that you might be asking is, why would we even want to learn about this? What's so special about these disks? Well, because this is such an exciting phenomenon that exists everywhere, and because it tends to also produce these jets in almost every case as well, trying to understand the dynamics inside the disks can technically help us understand so many different things about evolution of different objects. Not to mention one really simple fact. This is the most efficient generator of energy in the entire universe. The process of accretion that happens here can convert about 10 to 40% of mass into pure energy. This is compared to about 0.7% in a typical nuclear reaction inside a star. In other words, it can be up to 60 to 80 times more efficient in terms of energy production compared to fusion. Now, we don't really know what to do with this information just yet, but if we can actually create this somehow on Earth, that basically solves everything. All of our energy problems resolved once and for all. Which is one of the reasons why a lot of SETI scientists believe that if advanced civilizations exist, they would probably find a way to use this as the most efficient way of generating energy. So, for example, some kind of a Dyson sphere or Dyson sphere-like object around an accretion disk would be an extremely efficient way to convert energy from mass. And then they also generate the jets. In this case, the astrophysical jets come from the vicinity of the central object, and it's essentially a result of the disk itself trying to reduce the angular momentum without losing too much mass through a production of two jets in opposite direction that releases some of the mass at very high velocities, but usually in an extremely tightly woven environment. Normally these jets serve different purposes, but they always have dramatic effects on the environment. And in certain objects, such as baby stars, like this Herbic Harrow object we've discussed before in the video in the description, the amount of jets produced tends to dictate the final mass and the final type of a star. They basically serve as a kind of a feedback mechanism that either dramatically reduces the mass of the star or tends to feed the star even more, even encouraging mass formation around the star, which then results in different planets. So basically, all of this, in the end, is sort of connected. The jets, the accretion disk, the stars, the planets, and so on. Which is, of course, studying disks by themselves is sort of important. But the question is, how would you actually see disks from different black holes and neutron stars? Or how do we even know quasars have disks very similar to the ones around stars? And here things get really tricky, but so many intriguing. It's actually because of the different types of emissions that happen when certain types of atoms or certain types of stuff around the disk tends to collide producing those types of emissions. Here the essential rely on the emission spectrum. The emission lines resulting from the atom collision when the excited state drops to a lower energy level, releasing light in the process. Here's a really good example from the James Webb Space Telescope. This is from the famous Stevens Quintet. One of the galaxies here has an active black hole with an accretion disk that does have quite a lot of these collisions. And it essentially allows us to see the types of materials inside the disk and how it's ionized in certain locations. Now, by itself, just detecting, for example, hydrogen is not really going to tell us much if it's an accretion disk or just some gas around the black hole. But what if you actually see it twice and in slightly different frequencies? Or basically you're seeing the same thing but shifted by just a little bit. Well, that implies something else. That actually implies that something here is moving at very high velocities, and it seems to be moving around the central object. And that's precisely what we usually see around certain accretion disks. We see the approaching side and the receding side. And of course, depending on certain frequencies, you can then determine a lot about this particular black hole, including its mass and what sort of material it contains. This is normally referred to as double-peaked profiles, sometimes also known as the broad emission lines. And so because the disk is rotating, it's always going to produce different observations from anywhere else in the galaxy. This relative motion is so fast that it definitely produces visible results. Shorter wavelengths for some parts, longer wavelengths for other parts. Now this is actually a pretty rare phenomenon, 
So normally it just means that there is a really massive equation disk. More importantly, it normally has to be in just the right orientation, basically sort of like what you see right here. It would be difficult to observe redshift and blue shift if you were looking at the black hole from this perspective. But most of the observations so far have been using some kind of a hydrogen alpha or hydrogen beta lines, basically involving hydrogen atoms. This is normally only visible in optical light. But extremely recently, scientists made a major breakthrough using an extremely well-known galaxy. Actually, this galaxy. The one I usually use as my B-roll footage. M106. One of the largest and brightest nearby galaxies, somewhat similar to the Andromeda, but basically containing an active galactic nucleus. It's approximately 22 million light years away from us, and it's technically what's known as a Seifer galaxy. Although I guess some studies also identify it as a quasar. Uh, technically it's not a quasar, because we do see the rest of the galaxy. Nevertheless, the center here is extremely powerful, and obviously previously assessed by a lot of previous studies. But normally it was only observed in optical light or ultraviolet light by detecting what's known as Balmer lines using magnesium. Nobody has ever looked at this in the infrared. Well, nobody until now. Now they have, and they've discovered something really cool. By using the Gemini North Telescope, researchers behind the recent study in the description found a never-before-seen oxygen line that was actually visible in the near-infrared, additionally detecting a couple of more frequencies that all produce similar effects, these iconic double-peak emissions, representing the first time ever several lines were detected all at once and in frequencies never before seen, but more importantly, showing us the regions we've never seen before either, because this is infrared light, so it technically represents the edges of the accretion disk, the farthest distance from the black hole. For example, the hydrogen here shows us the distance of about 16.7 light days away from the center, whereas the oxygen line shows us the distance of 18.8 light days, which in terms of more solar system terms is about 3000 astronomical units, 3000 times the distance of Earth to the Sun, which once again means that the accretion disk here is really large. But the prediction here indicates that the outer edge is potentially as far away as 52 light days at least for some of the emissions visible in the infrared. That's about 9000 AU away from the central black hole. Although here the model also predicts that there's probably a bit of an inclination of 18 degrees with respect to planet Earth, so something very similar to what you see right here. And more importantly, they were able to recalculate the mass of the central black hole, it's probably about 400 to maybe 900 million solar masses. So definitely quite a giant, but not the biggest ever found. Although this is of course just the first such discovery and I guess more of a proof of concept. It's actually exciting for several other reasons. First, this is infrared light, which means that observing this with the James Webb will produce extremely accurate results and reveal new details that were basically not possible before. Second, by observing this over time and by seeing differences in how everything changes, it will most likely allow the scientists to understand the actual dynamic processes around the accretion disks and how things change around these supermassive black holes. Because it's so difficult to see what happens around them, this is one of the few ways we can directly study these giants, figuring out all of the processes and all of the important dynamics that don't just shape the black hole environment, but also then affect the rest of the galaxy. I mean, the main reason M106 looks this way is really because of the central black hole and the central accretion disk. If it wasn't for that supermassive black hole with a lot of activity, it would actually resemble the Andromeda. In terms of mass, number of stars, and even overall shape, it's extremely similar to the Andromeda galaxy. Yet the central accretion disk makes this galaxy just a little bit different, and extremely intriguing. And because now we have a new way to study these disks, it makes it even more interesting to study this unique galaxy. But that's of course just some of the first discoveries. I'm sure there will be more in the next few months, and so I'm definitely going to follow this up with the next video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining the membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.